right, well, let's kick off, Patrick, if you want to um, just introduce things from y'all's perspective, and then I can get going. Let me share my screen here um, so that we are as punctual as possible. All right. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Patrick Eisnagel uh, with Louisiana Department of Transportation and Development. I'm the e-construction engineer, and we head up a lot of the uh, technology and deployment efforts and support for a lot of the technology that we have uh, throughout the construction and materials process and and more included uh, and here recently uh, uh, we started with uh, they call it stick funding through fhwa it's it's like a strategic technology incentive um, i don't think that's the exact acronym but basically this is additional funding through fhwa that a state can use to basically trial uh, new technologies and pilot new technologies and demonstrate new technologies um, and basically learn uh, if it'll be beneficial for the state, how we can implement it across the state. It also gives uh, industry a chance to, to learn with us. And uh, in addition to the stick funding, uh, we've also paired up with a couple other states um, with uh, some federal grants to basically implement similar type and, and uh, evaluate uh, similar type of technologies. Uh, and some of the earlier, excuse me, some of the earlier uh, stick funded projects was uh, basically the e-ticketing uh, that a lot of you are familiar with uh, that we've, we've been trialing for the last couple of years and we're getting ready to uh, build a specification around and we've observed, you know, the safety enhancements, the uh, documentation management enhancements, uh, just the efficiency on both the DOT side as well as uh, the industry side of being able to do all this digitally instead of having to transfer the paper. And it's just a wealth of information uh, that's also been, uh, I guess, digitally captured where it can be supported in the construction file. And we're looking at, uh, I guess, other other type technologies that we can incorporate in a similar fashion, as well as other technologies uh, that are, you know, readily on the, the precipice of innovation that that we can evaluate as a state. And uh, you know, through these federal grants, um, what we're looking to do is is basically open up a pathway where uh, suppliers and contractors and industry can basically trial this at no cost to you. Uh, in the hopes that we can learn together, evaluate together, and you know this this gives you a chance to give us feedback on on your likes and dislikes and direction you think we should go with these things, uh, as well as you know what we can do with some of the data and some of the technology, uh, because in addition to the e-ticketing, uh, like I said, the the safety was a huge aspect of it during the the COVID pandemic, and what really pushed it on a national level. And we're starting to see other aspects of safety that can be built in uh, just with some of the geolocation of some of the ticketing information and, and items like that. Uh, so some of the direction that we've looked at as a department and we've kind of challenged to some of the IT industry is, uh, you know, can we, in addition to e-ticketing, we, we've asked about all of our certificates, our certificates of delivery, certificates of compliance. Uh, can we start looking at ways to to handle those in a digital format uh, and do those in a similar electronic transfer to e-ticketing. And that's something that, you know, Hall Hub is, is one that, that uh, so does a, a pilot of a solution. And it's something that is very interesting and very plausible and very straightforward. So it's something we're lo looking forward to. Uh, in addition to this, there's also a national push uh, to look at uh, we refer to it as connected equipment, um, both at the public level with connected and automated vehicles, but we're also looking at what we can do with this in a work zone. And the, the driving factor for a lot of this is the safety enhancements, um, and Joel's going to get really in-depth into a lot of this, uh, but the, the safety enhancements that, you know, being able to geolocate a lot of equipment, uh, being able to geolocate uh, inventory and and I don't know if they're planning on taking it to that level, but we've also discussed, you know, if there's ways where equipment can recognize uh, our workers in the field, 
Uh, I don't know if anyone's ever been on like the floor of an Amazon facility, but it's all robotic and they have machines running around and an actual person wears a badge where the machine will not encroach within a certain distance of them. So it basically makes the the machines aware of, of where people are and you're able to enhance the safety and make sure that there's no conflict with some type of automation. Um, so there, there's just a, a, a wealth of fascinating things and a wealth of ideas. I've, I've been kind of the idea guy pitching a lot of this stuff and, and I leave it up to these IT vendors uh, to come up with the solutions and come up with the, the products and come up with the process uh, for us to basically look at how we can fit that into our work zone, how we can fit that into our workflows and how we can fit that into our process. Uh, so as industry, if, if there's something that you think would benefit the department, if there's something that you think would benefit, uh, you know, safety enhancements as industry, um, you know, especially a lot of the, the industry leaders and agency leaders, uh, it's it's definitely something that, you know, we, we would be more than happy to evaluate and look at, you know, can we use the stick funding? Can we use this federal funding uh, to do these type of drops? So always welcome, always open ears and, and always love new ideas and, and new technology. And, you know, this, this is all about learning together. This is all about trying together. And this is all about, you know, being able to grow and, and progress the industry together. And uh, with today, uh, we have Hall Hub and I guess it's just you, Joel, leading, leading the charge here. That's right. Yep. <clears throat> Uh, but but Hall Hub is the vendor that uh, uh, we paired up with for a lot of our stick projects, especially the the digital certificates and connected equipment. Uh, so they're kind of our go-to vendor uh, right now. They're also the vendor that we are using uh, uh, for what we're calling our DOTD portal uh, for e-ticketing, where uh, all of our uh, industry can use whatever e-ticketing vendor you choose to use, but basically we're asking that uh, the information be standardized before it gets to the department, and that's where Hall Hub is, is kind of taking on that leg of uh, you know being that gathering point where all the information gets gets centralized and standardized before it gets fed to the department. So with that, uh, it looks like we have a question. Yeah, there's one in the chat, and then Reldon looks like he's raising his hand. Um, you can go first, Reldon. Okay, uh, thanks. The uh, question I had um, from some of the conversations that Patrick and I have had, uh, and then some of the email back and forth, um, and, and and if you touched on this, I mean, I was listening to everything you were saying that was possible from this, but you know, one of our thoughts in regard to the e-ticketing concept is um, improved communication from the job site, the contractor, to the project manager, to the, the district DOTD office, to from the standpoint of looking at it from payments, right? Uh, quicker, more uh, accurate information being fed directly to the department, which ultimately, you know, following that whole process, which ultimately would result in uh, quicker payments to the contractors. So if, if that is an aspect uh, I, I get the safety and the recognition of people on the job site and all that, and that's great. I mean, safety is wonderful, but that's another aspect that was of great interest to us. So if you would touch on that, and if that's in your presentation, I'll just sit back and listen. But I just wanted to mention it right after Patrick went through the from the department side. Uh, definitely. that That is uh, part of the efficiency aspect that I kind of hinted on. Uh, this is where uh, data is basically being generated once and is being passed where it needs to go instead of us having to manually exchange it on paper and then someone types it in and then that's manually exchanged to the next group. Uh, this is something that as a department, we recognize, um, you, you know, I, I've been in construction materials uh, pretty much my whole career with the department. And I've noticed that, you know, we tend to work with blinders on. So information from design, uh, you know, it, it, however it gets to construction is how it gets to construction. Well, we're starting to, you know, tear down some of these blinders and, and how can we make this a full scale uh, life cycle for a construction project where all the way from the, the planning to design to construction to our as built to our life cycle of, of the, uh, the, the pavement or life cycle of the structure is all captured and warehoused in a similar type data format 
that can essentially be passed back to planning when that time comes back around. And that that saves a lot of the planning time, saves a lot of the, the design time. Just having this information and not having to start from scratch every time where we're out, you know, punching pilot holes and punching boring holes and, and whatever we need to do to get uh, kind of the, the as-built situation of what's there. Uh, as far as the, the specification, the planning, the paying, uh, however we can get information flowing, the, the faster we can get it flowing, the faster a lot of these processes can happen. So as long as it meets the criteria that's currently in place, if we can get the information flowing faster, then definitely we can look at ways to improve. Uh, signing off for you know a lot, a lot of the payments and uh, checklist on, on closing projects, completing projects, and getting projects started. Because I, I know sometimes there's delays just getting stuff started. Good, good question. Yeah, great question. Um, right. Patrick, do you want to, I don't know if you can see the chat, talk about the specification and the variances now before I jump in, or you want to do that at the end? Uh, I, I cannot see the chat. Um, I, I just well, Maybe only I can up. see the chat, sorry. <laughs> it says, hey, Patrick, um, uh, okay. David Madden has a quick question. Patrick, what is, we we joined a touch late. We had audio problems. We apologize. What is the next ninety days? What do you want done in the next ninety days? I'm not interested in from design to letting. I'm interested in jobs let. What are you expecting Hall Hub to do with hot mix or concrete truck tickets? We've had we're starting construction tomorrow morning. Tell me what Hall Hub's supposed to do. What are these tickets supposed to do? I don't know too much about the concrete deal, but let's say we're laying hot mix and we laid a hundred loads yesterday. It's all electronically gathered. I'm assuming there is one spreadsheet being sent to a DOT office to eliminate all this manual paper ticket entry. Tell me what's happening in the next 90 days. All right. So for a new vendor, um, if you already have an e-ticketing uh, vendor in place, which it sounds like you do, uh, basically you you get in touch with Hall Hub Support. Uh, they schedule. Um, what, well, actually, if if a vendor is already in place, if it's a vendor that is already uh, paired up with Hall Hub, it's just a matter of them syncing the data across platform, and. Most of that I see done in within you know a 24 to 48 hour window. Uh, once the data is flowing, it's a matter of uh, setting up the project in the DOT portal, which again is a very short process, getting users assigned. And it's not we're sending the information at the end in a single spreadsheet. It's when you generate a ticket, uh, within five minutes, the uh, DOT person in the field is able to receive that ticket essentially when the truck shows up on site. So instead of them having to actually pass that physical paper ticket that we require with every truck, they're able just to receive the ticket digitally and carry on. So really there's not much change to your everyday process with e-ticketing. All we're doing is replacing that digital exchange of the paper, or, or excuse me, replacing that exchange of the paper with a digital exchange. Hey Patrick, is the Contractor, what is the contractor liable to for sending the paperwork to the DOT as far as on site? In in reference to like the the batch well, ticketing, yes, sir. So as far as a batch ticket, once that ticket is generated, are we the batch concrete? Are they sending? They're sending that directly to the contractors. Is the contractor's responsibility to get that ticket to DOT, or is it the ready? So. Date? So we we set up the uh, basically whatever e-ticketing vendor the the, the supplier is using the plant's using uh, they should have an option for the contractor to have visibility into that and we're looking at ways where the DOT portal will also have visibility for contractors essentially so that that data is transparent. Do we still collect the paper ticket at the job site and give that to DOT, or is that completely enough gone away? In in the pilots, we were requesting both. Uh, when we adopt uh, 
full scale e ticketing, that's completely going away. Um, I just need to double check if there's any other requirements on you know what needs to accompany the truck physically, and that's something where you know we'll we'll work with whatever group. Um, because I someone mentioned to me at one point that there may be federal requirements of what needs to accompany the truck, and that's something where if the digital ticket can easily be pulled up on a phone, similar to my ID card. Uh, for my car insurance, you know, as long as there's a way to to show proof of of uh, what's in the truck digitally, uh, it it should work in in progress as well. Follow up, uh, this is Reldon. Follow up question to what David just asked. Now, so as I appreciate it, this uh, e ticketing uh, submittal scenario is still in the pilot phase, so you can opt in and use it if as David said, he has a vendor, so he could start using this as long as the project is identified in the pilot. Uh, so is that correct? And is that the phase we're in at currently? Uh, we're, we're kind of transitioning at the end of the pilot phase. Uh, however, the, the uh, setup that we have uh, as far as uh, connecting to Pawhub, it costs nothing. So it's just a matter of if, if you have a project you want to use a ticketing on, let us know and we'll get the process set up. And I believe even after we get into the specification, it's still no cost to get it uh, basically connected through Hall Hub if you have an existing e-ticketing vendor. Now, if you do not have an e-ticketing vendor, I think Hall Hub has so, packages that that stuff you can discuss with them. Yeah, I, I'll, I I'll get into some specifics about that as I'm going, um, The how to the options we provide to connect. But all of them are covered, whether or not you have a vendor or not, which I have a slide for that. The, yeah, we're, we don't specify what vendor you have to use. We just specify that essentially your data has to connect through our DOT portal. All right, well, let me, David Madden again, let me ask the Hall Hub guy straight up. We're a uh, fleet watcher. Do y'all talk to each other? Yes, sir. We have a great relationship with Fleet Watcher. Um, we've got an established process with them where essentially y'all sign off that you want the data shared um, in an email to us and Fleet Watcher. And then we take it from there to get the data connected. And then we would circle back with y'all to confirm that it all looks correct in our system as y'all expect. Thank you. We we had a few fleet watchers in our in our demonstration and pilot projects as well. Yep. So we'll have some time for questions and answers at the end. I do go through e-ticketing as well as some of the new technology. So we can jump into that. The last question I wanted to make sure we hit now though was the question about the variances. The question is e-tickets have highlighted that concrete suppliers aren't able to consistently meet the one percent cemented spec. What spec variance will be allowed going forward, and when will that variance be available to those participating in the e-ticket pilot program? Uh, that's that's basically what we're we're writing the specification around now. Um, we've discussed with between research materials construction. Uh, we we've been basically looking at the uh, variances just of the everyday uh, information that we've seen through e-ticketing, as well as. Uh, uh, printed batch ticket information that come in. We've had you know thousands of individual individual truck submittals come in, uh, and I don't have the exact numbers in front of me, but we are looking at basically widening these tolerances, uh, and we're we're hoping to basically pair that up with e-ticketing, where vendors that opt into e-ticketing will will be eligible for these wider tolerances. Oh, and yeah. and this is on the some cementitious and supplemental cementitious materials that we we looked at the tolerances. What are the what's your pilot can program? You, Sorry, go ahead. Can right you there. elaborate on these tolerances? Does that apply to cement or is that I don't know what the tolerances are, please. Can quickly uh, right, right right now in the in the printed book, uh, the cement tolerance is plus or minus one percent. And I, I, I want to say the proposed was looking at maybe dropping the, the negative side down to, to two, negative two, and the positive <laughs> side up to like plus four, somewhere in that range. So the way batch ticket information is printed on this concrete ticket electronic <laughs> printing sent to you guys? Right. It, it's 
when the batching information for concrete is printed, it's printed by truck. And the a lot of the vendors will also put on there the the um, target, and it shows the variance between the target versus the actual batch that went in the truck. And that was something that we learned early on in the pilot was uh, some some uh, inspectors were basically seeing the the variance number on there and immediately uh, questioning trucks. And that's something that you know we we looked at. What's realistic? Because the plus or minus one did not seem very realistic after we started seeing, you know, just a wealth of data from across the state. Okay. What do you want on a hot mix ticket? Well, the, the hot mix ticket was something that we, we've we been kind of rolling a few ideas around. Um, right now, because of the way you silo, it's, it's very hard to get, you know, what's exactly in the truck. Uh, so that's something that, you know, we, we may have an open discussion with, with some of the asphalt side and hot mix side on, uh, you know, is that something that we can capture what goes into a silo batch? Is that something that we can capture? Uh, but right now at present day, it's it's just a matter of, of currently what's on the batch ticket, usually just the tonnage and the uh, contract and, and lot information. Okay. Thank you. Um, great. The, the last question on this note is, um, I guess for pilot programs that are actively underway, um, and maybe are running into this tolerance issue, should we, what should they do? Should they reach out to you or the project team about that? Uh, so, sorry, I was reading chat one more time. Uh, what do pilot programs do in the meantime? So programs that are maybe that projects that are running into the variance issue currently, um, is there anything they can do in the, in the meantime while the specs getting approved? Oh yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, reach out to my group. Um, you know, we, we talk with contract or excuse me, construction administration. We talk with, uh, the research group and, and basically with these under pilot, uh, we, we've been talking with a lot of the inspectors, educating them, uh, you know, telling them the direction we're headed and and basically, you know, have, allowing us to use a, a better judgment versus, you know, taking the exact strict number on the ticket. So so definitely reach out if you're having issues. Uh, we, we've had a few in the past uh, that we've been able to work with and, and talk with the inspector. Uh, I do have a question uh, with the industry. Uh, <laughs> excuse me, uh, LAGC, uh, LAPA, and LCA be able to see the draft spec as it's being written. Uh, yes, as as we develop specification, we definitely share with industry and and get your input and and feedback and anything like that. Perfect. Now there there is a national specification that covers. I mean, it covers a wealth of material delivery information that we're kind of using as a basis. Um, and we have looked at several other states uh, that have stuff in place that we're we're kind of building a draft around. So we're we're not just writing it out of the blue. We're we're taking feedback from a lot of other sources to to get it into one. All right, appreciate that, Patrick. Um, thank you all for the questions. I'll jump in here um, and we'll go through this. My content shouldn't take much more than 30 minutes um, and then we'll have some more time for questions because I'm sure some will arise as I go through this content. So um, let's see if I can get it to change there. So as Patrick said, my name's Joel Van Dusen. I'm Director of Government Solutions with Hall Hub. I've been working with Patrick and his team since the beginning of the demonstration process on the e-ticketing rollout. And then I've been working with states across the country on um, some of this advanced technology and on e-ticketing in general as well. Um, so I appreciate y'all taking the time here just so y'all have an understanding of where we're headed in this conversation. The first section is gonna be talking about e-ticketing, um, where we're at in Louisiana right now. I'll get into a bit of specifics on the e-ticketing but can always dive deeper as needed during the question and answers. Then we'll talk about how e-ticketing is the gateway to e-construction and put a bit of definition around that. 
Um, and then we'll talk about what comes after uh, digitize and pay for tickets. So like um, Patrick said, some of the safety and traffic communication as well as enhanced digital inspection. And that's the crux of this conversation is recapping e-ticketing, but then also talking about this new batch of demonstration projects and the new program that we're working under for this year. So with that said, given the high level e-ticketing roadmap, just so we're all kind of working on the same definition, um, what is e-ticketing? It's streamlining the way that materials information is delivered to all parties involved in the supply chain. So it's going from all of that paper to a digital format with the goal of increased transparency, increased safety, and increased efficiency. So hitting on some of those key points that we talked about um, during the beginning. Just to make sure we all have the same definition of what an e-ticket is and isn't, Patrick mentioned that you know, the drive of e-ticketing um, at first, a big drive nationally was due to COVID. And with that came some maybe stopgap measures. Uh, maybe you were sending PDFs of tickets to inspectors in the field to get rid of the paper or sending pictures of tickets to a shared folder. And those were all perfect and what was needed at the time to get stood up quickly. But those want to be considered an e-ticket um, today. An e-ticket, simply put, is the digital transfer of the materials data from the source system, so from the plant or the batch facility, to the end user, so to the department's um, system, and then also to the contractors and supplier systems for they, they can see it. So it's that data staying digital um, that whole time and being transmitted, which then opens up a wealth of other reporting and functionality opportunities when all of the data is digitized and, and centralized, and that's what we'll get into today. So this is what I mentioned when it came to um, talking about the different options that suppliers have that um, to get connected. Um, so this is what we offer every state that's utilizing our, our portal, and all of these are covered in our contract with the state, regardless of which option you choose. And we've got folks in Louisiana that are already taking advantage of all three of these. Um, there are different folks using different ones. So I do just want to put a plug here and talk about these for the suppliers in the room that haven't integrated with, with us yet so that you're aware of your options. So the first option is uh, if you've got, if you're looking for a hassle-free managed solution, um, Patrick mentioned it, but we as Hall Hub can work with you to connect to your plants. Um, we would work with you to get the mappings uh, for all of the ticket fields in the correct format for both the state and for y'all to be happy with. And then the uptime requirements and those types of things would be our responsibility. So making sure that the that the system is running and the tickets are getting to the DOT in a um, timely manner. So that typically takes about an hour to integrate um, with your plant system. And then we do a training um, Yes, you can record. I didn't know that was an option. I'm also recording this. Um, I should have mentioned that recording it uh, centrally um, for so we'll be able to share it with you all after. Um, sorry. So the first option is that you can um, we can connect directly with you about 80 percent of the tickets in our in our system nationwide come through that first option. Um, for producers seeking to internally manage your integration, so if you've got an internal IT team that is able to work with APIs and moving data automatically, um, you can post data to our API, um, and then it would be up to your IT team to ensure the mappings are correct, ensure the tickets are arriving in a timely manner. Our, our integration team works with your team to give them guidance on how to set it up and all of the technical documentation. Um, about 18% of tickets in our system come through that second option. And then the third option is for suppliers with existing e-ticketing solutions. Um, your current e-ticketing vendor can post data to a similar API. So a similar process as number two, it's just your vendor is the one in charge of the mappings and the uptime requirements instead of your internal IT team. So that's about 2%. And I mean, we talked about it with the Maddens. We've got um, we've got a relationship with several vendors already. Fleet Watchers in an established process and there's more, um, which gets me to this slide. Um, this slide is dotready.com, which is RDY, is our tracker for integration process across the country and then specifically to Louisiana as well. 
Um, so you can go here now. It's live to see who's already integrated in Louisiana and across the country in our other partner states. And then you can also click on that e-ticket vendors tab up in the top right, which shows you which vendors have established processes to share tickets to our system and have met the security requirements and those types of things. I'll also put in the um, chat at the end, we have a landing page that y'all can go to to sign up um, for our team to reach out to you to get the integration started. So I'll include that at the end if you'd like to start the process of getting your e-tickets integrated. Um, just to kind of give the milestones and the timeline of where we've been in Louisiana. So in fall of 2020-ish, Louisiana began doing pilots of e-ticketing on selected projects without a centralized system. Then in the spring, around April of 2022, the e-construction team identified uh, challenges with data clarity. So Patrick kind of mentioned that. Um, it's, it's just an inherent um, challenge with using multiple different systems is that sometimes the data can't, is typically not standardized. And um, so our system was brought in in November of 2022 to do a demonstration on the centralized concept of being able to um, get it all in one place and standardize it for the DOTD. Um, then in January through October of 2023, we had 15 successful demonstration projects with both uh, asphalt and PCC. Um, in November of 2023, we launched our vendor portal. So Patrick mentioned that briefly. I'll talk about it in a bit more depth um, later on in the presentation, but this portal allows one um, for uh, vendors like y'all who are submitting certificates of analysis and certificates of compliance and those types of things to be able to do this in the centralized location um, where the material tickets are. But then it also allows for vendors that are delivering uh, products onto DOT sites that aren't you know, part of the traditional e-ticketing materials. So obviously we have asphalt, concrete, and aggregates, but we know there's rebar and precast and guardrail going to these job sites, and those have um, certificates of delivery and um, those other types of certificates. So this vendor portal is also designed for those folks to be able to take advantage of these digital construction possibilities. Um, then in November of 2023, Louisiana received the ADCMS grant from FHWA. So Patrick mentioned that and I'll go into much more depth on that um, later on in the presentation. Kind of coming up to date, um, e-ticketing will be required on the PCC projects with higher tolerances, like Patrick mentioned. We'll be on, encouraged on um, asphalt jobs for this year. And then um, looking ahead to the rest of the year, um, we'll be deploying this connected job site technology, which is what the, the rest of the presentation will be on, um, on select demonstration projects in the 2024 season. So. Um, kind of wrapping up this e-ticketing um, overview section, I think something we want to acknowledge is that, and you guys are way more aware of this than we are, workforce challenges continue to, to rise. Horizontal construction has to do more with less resources. 41% of the industry is set to retire over the next decade. Millennials and Gen Z were born with technology in their hands, so we need to embrace it. Um, and we don't think that technology is a panacea and it's suddenly going to fix everything, but we do think it can play a part. And that's our goal here on some of these, on some of these technologies is to um, make things more efficient and y'all be able to do more with less. And so we'll talk about that a bit um, as we continue into the next part of the presentation. Okay. So e-construction, what does it look like? E-construction is a broad term. It's kind of been thrown, been thrown around a lot. Um, simply put, e-construction is, digitizing the existing workflows in a way that's easily shareable and compatible between the different stakeholders within a project. Um, so here in our platform, we've got a different platform for each um, member of the supply chain here and stakeholder in the project. So we've got an agency platform, suppliers, contractors, and vendors, and all four of those talk to each other and share data to try to um, increase the performance and efficiency and communication on a project. Um, so I'm going to go into some high level of what each platform kind of some of the functionality it has for each um, stakeholder. Uh, next. Okay, so the agency platform. Um, 
The agency platform is focused on digital inspection. So obviously we have the material tickets coming in. We'll discuss in a bit about bringing in the equipment data as well um, and trying to layer in uh, those workflows, uh, you know, QA information, samples information into one central place for the DOT. Um, then it's work zone protection. So Patrick mentioned some of the safety aspects at the beginning. We'll dive deep into those in a bit on uh, this demonstration initiative. Uh, environmental tracking. There are some components of the platform already built to allow for the ease of communication of that data between parties. Obviously, the feds are still kind of deciding what they want to require and what they want to gather. And so our goal is that as those requirements are made more clear, we're able to make the communication of that between the suppliers and contractors and agencies as seamless as possible. And then uh, all of the activities that are happening on the job site, all of the material that is being placed needs to be on a map and needs to be visualized for tracking in a, in a format that can be agreed upon by both the agency and the contractor. So all of this, you know, is ultimately the goal is to get it on a map for digital as-built tracking. On the supplier side, um, the big component is being able to review your material operations. So you'd be able to see your plant information and your material op information across plants in one centralized location. Um, you can easily calibrate to the DOT projects to make sure the right tickets are getting to the right place. Um, the environmental tracking I mentioned, um, a lot of what that's built on is EPDs, you know, environmental product declarations. Y'all are probably aware of those. So there's already some components in here where y'all as the suppliers can import them in here and track them along with your materials data if you'd like to track those and then also share them with the DOT. Again, optional features. Uh, and then sharing val valuable data. I think this goes along with the whole ethos of this e-construction is trying to enable the flow of this information seamlessly. And so on the supplier side, we make it very easy for you to share data with your internal teams to improve your efficiency in production, as well as with your customers um, so they can see the data as well. Okay, for contractors, um, main focus is collaboration and uh, managing work zones, and we'll get into some of those specifics, but the contractor solution has some quality assurance and control aspects. You're able to centralize your uh, machine data in one place and share it with the DOT um, as needed. You're able to um, have shared orders between the different stakeholders on a project and then some compliance and documentation. And we'll get into some more specifics there in a bit. And then I've mentioned the vendors. I won't go over this much more, but you have the ability to upload those certificates and submittals, um, assign them to DOT projects seamlessly and store all this information in the same place. So you've got your uh, certificates uh, as well as your materials data. All right, so what's next, the road ahead? Obviously we've kind of been focused on e-ticketing up until this point, and now we're kind of talking about um, this next batch of demonstration projects and the goal here. So simply put, we're asking for volunteers to be a part of this demonstration um, process. Um, Patrick mentioned the ADCMS grant, which stands for Advanced Digital Construction Management Systems, as well as their stick funding. So the grant was awarded by FHWA to Louisiana, Delaware, Iowa, and Nebraska to um, do these uh, demonstration projects and to continue to develop this technology. So the main two objectives of this grant application are enhancing work zone safety and enhancing digital inspection capabilities. And we'll talk about specifics there next. So the safety goal. The safety goal is to transform every material load from plants, each mach machine in the work zone, digitally capable devices used during construction and on-site staff presence into real-time safety indicators for the traveling public with the end result being to reduce work zone incursions. On the digital inspection side, the goal is for collaboration between tech providers, uh, agencies, and industry to determine what data can be used to improve DOT processes for inspection. The goal being researching what data will be useful for both agencies and industries to increase project performance and efficiency. 
So how are we going to enhance work zone safety? Obviously, that's a big initiative nationwide. And so I want to explain what we're doing to do our part. So we're reimagining how job sites communicate with the traveling public to increase the safety and awareness that construction is actively underway. And we're doing that by connecting the machines and other devices on the job site, like I mentioned, and then sharing that there is active uh, construction to the work zone data exchange and consumer mapping systems like Waze, Google Maps, um, Apple Maps, et cetera. So the types of equipment that we've already connected um, that are relevant here, this is not an exhaustive list, but pavers, rollers, millers, et cetera, those are types of equipment that we can, we can connect. So putting a bit of definition around the work zone data exchange and the consumer mapping systems. So currently our system in, um, is built where we can automatically send these construction activity um, notifications to uh, the consumer mapping system. So two ways where it's live on the map and notifying the traveling public that there's active uh, an active work zone with uh, workers present as well as to the work zone data exchange. And the work zone data exchange without getting too technical is just a federal uh, program where they're trying to centralize all of these construction activities into one place to then be shared. So we're participating in that, but while it's still being developed, we're also going directly to these platforms to try to make the uh, difference now. So what does that actually look like? Um, why is it different than how Waze is set up now or how the 511 in Louisiana is set up now. The big difference is a planned versus real-time uh, strategy. So right now, the way that construction activity is often reported to the 511 or to these mapping systems is on a planned capacity. So, you know, you say, we're going to be working on I-5 for the next five months. And so that's going to be listed as active for five months. But in reality, we all know that your crews might be out there for a fraction of that for whatever reason, whether it's weather or just different project priorities. And so if the traveling public is traveling through that and it's being reported as active and there's not crew out there, they may become numb to those um, or start ignoring those uh, alerts when they drive through. And so what our system is does and what's different about it is that it's all real time. So as soon as an equip a piece of equipment that we're connected to turns on in the work zone, we'd start reporting it as active. As soon as a material ticket is sent to a work zone, we can start reporting it as active. As soon as an inspector is out there acknowledging that there, that there are workers present, even if there's not a machine or material flowing, um, we can report that as active to the traveling public and then it would notify them um, and be available in those dashboards. So this is a visualization of what it looks like. Um, it's very simple. You can see the inspector sets it up on the left-hand side there. They're able to move their work zones easily if the project is moving. And then it just runs in the background. So then anytime we see an activity on the project, we would alert it. And then that's what it looks like within Waze. Um, currently active workers, active road work workers present um, wherever that project is set up. On the digital inspection side, um, our thesis here is combining the existing materials data with equipment data opens up a world of possibilities to improve digital inspection workflows uh, for both the industry and agencies. But we totally acknowledge that this is gonna require collaboration with all stakeholders. Um, obviously the sharing of this data needs to be agreed upon and needs to be clear and all sites need to have visibility into it. And so our goal with this process is the same philosophy we've taken from with you ticketing from the beginning as we've rolled this out across um, states is starting simple and then collaborating and exploring how improvements can be made. So we'll kind of talk through the start simple process. So this slide is a bit technical. There's some acronyms in here. Um, I don't want to get too technical. Really what I want to communicate here is um, the AEMP, so the Association of Equipment Management Professionals, I'm sure you all are aware of them. All of the OEMs are members of this um, and have agreed to this AEMP 2.0 spec, which is a universal standard for how equipment telematics data is collected and reported, ensuring compatibility and consistency across various uh, manufacturers and, and systems. So that's a lot of jargon. 
really what I'm trying to communicate is that this is not a custom thing that we have to work with you to build a process to connect to your work in Miller. And then it's different when we do it on a different job. This is an established process, uh, an established spec that these um, OEMs have agreed to and have already built their systems. So that's a compatible. We've already connected to a lot of them where it's it's becomes just getting the VIN numbers and activating the API, not this big custom process of getting this data flowing. And the other key thing is that it's already been agreed upon what types of data are being shared through this specification. So it's very basic information like the location of the asset, some identifying information about the asset, um, some, some information around um, the fuel burn, idling time. The main things that we're looking at are the identifying information and then the location of the asset. Um, and then everything else is kind of what we are collaborating with y'all on how it can be used and what would be helpful. So just to make this a bit more tangible, I know that was a bit technical, like these are some of the commercially available offerings that y'all may already be taking advantage of. Um, and these are all built upon this specification and upon the same system that we would be connecting to. So got a Capillar Vision Link, John Deere Operations Center. I've got a few more logos up there. This is not by any means an exhaustive list. It's more just trying to make this tangible that this system, these systems are built and ready to be connected to. It's not like a custom process. Okay, um, so this, this shot here is a drone flyover shot from our demonstration process project where we first um, deployed this technology in Delaware. And I, I share this photo to try to make, um, to make this a bit more concrete on how this could be used in, in a digital inspection setting. So what we've got here to explain this photo a bit is we've got the paver, um, the roller, and then the material tickets with the inspector marking those as delivered. And we had all three bits of that information feeding into the Dell dot portal. And then this drone was flying over um, and taking images of the job site. And what we were able to see here uh, with this with this image um, is we had the location of the paver at the time that the inspector marked this ticket as delivered, as well as the location of the roller. And they were all right next to each other, according to the data that we were receiving from these machines. So I think this is a great visualization of what's possible here, where if we're able to combine these different elements and these different data elements, it's going to open up a world of possibilities uh, for digital inspection capabilities. So, I mean, one tangible example that we've already started working on is the, the automation of the daily work reports that inspectors have to fill out and note how much material was on the job and which machines were on the job and those types of things. A lot of that information is already here and could be easily generated to save time and save um, communication effort uh, through this process. Another example is, you know, these pavers are able to communicate how much material went through them and what they did that day. And so our, if we're able to pair that up with the materials data that we received from the plant, that's gonna greatly um, improve and uh, make the communication at the end of the day of the contractor and the inspector agreeing upon what, what was performed and what happened much quicker when we have those two data sources next to each other and able to um, confirm each other. So those are just two examples of um, use cases. That's not an exhaustive list by any means, just trying to put some thought around what's possible here. So almost wrapping up here, I, I've mentioned this uh, demonstration project that we deployed this technology on. So we did do it across two weekends in Delaware in December of 20, November and December of 2023. Just to give you an idea of the timeline, um, the contractor was engaged and we had their equipment connected within 30 days of each other. So this is not a long drawn out process to get these equipment connected. And honestly, it'd probably be faster now because we have um, some of these connections already established and ready. Uh, this QR code here is a link to a story map, to a storyboard that the Dell dot team wrote up. So they wrote up a um, overview of the project, what they learned, what type of data was available, with some interactive maps. So you can scan that. I'll also include it in the chat at the end of this presentation, the link to it. Um, 
But this map here on the right-hand side that's playing is one of the interactive maps. And I included it just to showcase uh, the data and how it's how it was visualized so far. But you can see here, you've got the, um, the black dot is the paver, the green triangle is the roller, and then the little ticket looking things are the tickets. And so you're able to see the job progress with all three data points here um, throughout the weekend. So wrapping up here, a bit of what's next, what do we need in the next 90 days or what are we looking to get out of this? The goal for 2024 is to, that Louisiana is seeking 15 to 20 projects to deploy this technology on as part of this demonstration. So Patrick mentioned that these would be covered under the different programs that they have access to. That number could fluctuate uh, depending on the size and scope of them. Um, but we're looking really for as many projects as possible to begin this process with. The process to get connected and to begin this is, is a pretty simple one. We as Hall Hub would need to meet with y'all as the contractor to understand what project you would want to do this on, as well as what uh, types of machines are on that project and if they're data capable already. Just to give you an idea, pretty much any piece of equipment from about 2018 or newer has these capabilities built in, whether or not they're turned on for y'all and y'all are utilizing them. You may already be utilizing some of them for yourselves and we could connect to. And then there are lots of retrofit and aftermarket options that can be included um, if you wanted to look into that route. Um, but the process is, like I said, evaluating what machines you have and their current capabilities and then working with you to get those connected. Really, it's our team that would just need some basic information from you around the VIN number and the identifying information for then us to connect to the APIs. And then we would train you and your team on the contractor access and how you can see the data. Um, and then it would really just run in the background during the project. Uh, these safety feeds would run in the background and be transmitting whenever a project was active. Um, and then we would have obviously follow-up meetings to discuss our findings, collaborate. As I mentioned, that's a big part of this process. Um, but the goal is that it would be set up and then run in the background. So if you'd like to participate, or if you wanna have a more in-depth conversation about your setup specifically, you can reach out to myself or Patrick. We've included our emails there um, to, to have further conversations. So with that, um, that does it for my presentation. I'm sure there's some more questions after that. Happy to take those either via chat or um, you know, discussing it. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I've I've got a couple chats. Uh, uh, one was about document management, and and that's something where, uh, as I said, we we've, we've been kind of uh, working in our own little zones as a department, and that's something uh, we we actually had a discussion yesterday about. Uh, you know, how do we look at as a department? Um, you know, items that get managed from. Uh, section to section and group to group, uh, better ways of, of handling that and looking at a big picture application instead of each individual group, basically finding what works for them and then figure out how to pass it later. Uh, so that is something that's in discussion. Um, and I, I've, I've talked with several vendors that, that have offered that type of capability as well. So we'll probably be evaluating those here soon. Um, I, I did look up the uh, tolerances. The proposed was from... Uh, minus two to plus six instead of the negative one to plus one. Uh, again, in the, the meantime with the pilots, um, that's something where we're, we're having to handle on a case by case basis. Uh, as soon as we have a specification uh, hashed out and, and run it through all the channels for, for comments and approval, um, we'll basically have that available in any ongoing project. We'll probably be able to zero change order that end. Uh, can you can you roll it back to the email addresses, Joe? Yes, thank you. There you go. It's going to be the same. Um, just uh, other things as as we think about these. Uh, Joe mentioned the EPDs. Uh, that's something that has been a national discussion across materials and construction. Uh, that's something that I know federal specifications are starting on. Uh, so I don't know how soon they will basically be enforced on states. 
uh, but it's something that we are expecting to come down the line as as ways of managing uh, EPDs and you know what's required on the generation, what's required on the submittal, and that's something that we'd look at a way to standardize. Uh, so we've we've discussed this with vendors about getting it into a centralized portal. Uh, the the other big discussion I've seen from states is is moving toward the uh, the BIM uh, construction and BIM uh, the three D modeling and and uh, basically three D design and and how that can carry over to equipment where it's almost AI assisted in what the equipment's doing in the field and this is kind of the first step of of opening that communication with the equipment and being able to pull information off the equipment. Uh, so as we progress into the future, and and we all know, you know, the direction this is headed because we've seen, you know, some of the smart cars and and Tesla and and what they're doing for the public, we're going to start seeing similar advancements uh, with construction equipment, and we're going to start seeing similar advancements within the work zone. Uh, so it, it's something that you know this gives us the opportunity to to try out together and learn together, and by all means, if it's something that you know you throw your arms up, we want to hear about it. We want the feedback, positive or negative. Are you taking questions now? Uh, sure, go ahead. David Madden Patrick on the drone overview slide that had to pay for the roller, the inspector you captured lap long. Are you expecting that inspector to be right beside that delta buggy clicking that ticket received? I'm going to tell you that's probably not going to happen just because I know how inspectors do. They, they're they going to, if there's a line of seven trucks, they're going to go pick up seven tickets in a row and they're going to camp out in one spot till you catch up with them. Are you expecting to capture exact lat long truck backed into a shuttle buggy is that your intention if it is do you envision that inspector being right there with that shuttle buggy uh, actually there's uh stuff in in some of the demonstrations that we've seen where the offloading of the truck is actually automatically captured when it gets within range of the paper so there, there are all alter alternatives to this that, that basically show the inspector where that truck offloaded, where they don't have to be right there beside it. And that's something that we learned during the demonstration processes uh, that, you know, oftentimes they're not right there next to it when it gets offloaded. Uh, so we, we are looking at incorporating that into the workflow of how to properly handle that and how to properly, you know, what, what data would be required in that type of situation. I'll say too, if, if we, if we are connected to the paver and we and the inspector is at least marking it as delivered at the right time, even if they're not in the right location, we have the paver's location and we have the time that the inspector marked it as delivered. We're able to also deduce the location of that load based off of that. Again, you're right, David. It's not 100%, but it is moving there if we're getting the times accurate. Um, so Patrick's idea, or I mean answer is an option but then also even without having the truck location we could still pair up those times if we have the paper location and so i know a lot of the applications have a a qc option where the qc person could mark uh, and add notes and and that's something where you know the the contractor can actually mark it as you know showed up offloaded at this time for when the inspector to mark it as accepted and delivered they they have the notes there as well. All right. Well, the QC guy is going to be five hundred feet to fifteen hundred feet behind with the rollers. The inspector is going to be fifteen hundred feet ahead of all the operation in his truck, honestly. So, if the truck and the paver are within the vicinity of one another, will DOT accept that ticket as dumped? and pay me or is there an option to put some handheld device with the dump man at the paver that when that truck backs up there 
he hit, he can recognize it and acknowledge don't and you take it because <clears throat> how accurate do you want to be because all the contractors whether they're delivering cement or hot mix all we're interested in is get somebody accepting and acknowledging that ticket that the vehicle was there and get us paid Right. Well, I can speak to how it's done with Fleet Watcher that you have a GPS device on your paper or your milling machine and you set a geo zone around that piece of equipment. So once the truck enters that geo zone, it's dumped. When it leaves the geo zone, you know, it's it, it that's when you know that load was dumped. So if you're pulling this information from Fleet Watcher, that's how that would work. I don't know about the other systems. Right. And, and and that's the type of supporting information that I was referring to that that basically shows us that that truck was in, in the vicinity of that paver offloading. So whether it's done by, you know, some type of uh, a third party QC or your, your actual guy in the dump, um, you know, indicating that, hey, it was it was offloaded at this time. That's the type of additional information I'm talking about can now be added to these tickets electronically to support that information where if the inspector is not in the exact vicinity, you know, they're further down the road because we, we get asked to do more with less all the time. All right. But it's so, the plan for DOT to acknowledge that ticket dump and pay the contractor because what we're, if we're paperless, the last thing I want to do is be 90 days after the fact arguing over well we don't think that truck was in that geo zone long enough There's, you made the comment at 9 24 a.m that we have to use our better judgment where is the better judgment and trust coming in to say the truck was there we acknowledge it it's going to get paid I mean that that is the the what this information is capturing, right? Is is the timing of the truck? But the inspector's and, not going to be shuttle buddy. I want you to really understand he will not be standing by that shuttle buddy. I mean, I, I hear cases today where an inspector's just collecting a stack of tickets after the fact. So I would rather have the supporting information than just going off of the. And, and that way, there's no question. It, it's basically being covered with transparency on both sides. You know, that, that data shows that the truck was there. All right. I can get around a specification that it, if the truck is physically geo-fenced or whatever on that project, that I will get paid. You mentioned just then a stack of tickets. We're not going to have a stack of tickets as supporting data. If we're paperless, no. we're paperless, and no, somebody I'm, has to trust. I'm saying in the in the current system with paper, I'm hearing cases where someone else is collecting and just handing over a stack of tickets. I I know everything doesn't go exactly as everyone expects it in the field, uh, so the, the more that that we can basically automate and rely on this electronic data transfer the more that we have covered on everybody's side because we're basically capturing a truth, correct? Okay. There's lots of places, especially where me and I saw Alvin Miller was on here earlier, North Louisiana. Lots and lots of pine trees. There are dead zones within work zones that you may have an entire job, a six-mile job that is in rural Northwest Louisiana, not in the Delta, that you don't have connectivity. You have to leave to go make a phone call. How is that going to be handled? Because we're not in South Louisiana where it's all 20 foot elevation. I, I have other uh, stick funded projects where we're looking at uh, what we're calling a, a, a connected or Wi Fi enabled work zone where we're looking at bringing in satellite repeaters to basically create the on-site network within the, the active portion of the construction zone. So okay. if you have, if you have projects, let me know. I'd love to come test out some of this other equipment. 
I'll say too, we are using using this e-ticketing in uh, West Virginia and rural West Virginia and rural North Dakota and places with dead zones as well. So we have some functionality built in where the inspector and contractor can still log their notes digitally and then it all syncs up at the end of the day. Obviously, that doesn't get the data out there. And so there's a reality that until those types of um, systems that Patrick mentioned on those other stick funding um, applications get more uh robust and available there's going to have to be at least a copy of the paper ticket uh going to the job site to get the at least ticket number but then the inspector can log their information digitally still and have it all in the same place so um we acknowledge there's a bit of a, a you're going to have to have a hybrid for now until those technologies advance as far as your wage map showing construction active Yes, sir. I think that's a good thing. Let me ask you this. The first thing the motor public's going to see is a lane closure, and the first piece of equipment that's in the lane closure is actually the crash truck that's typically 400 feet in advance of the transition taper. Is there the most economical way to alert the public is to wire the crash truck and the inspector or the contractor at that point basically send an email to wherever, whatever, two mile lane closure, and they know exactly where it starts because the crash truck is the first thing they're going to run into. You know, it's not necessarily the favor of the shuttle buggy. Yes, they're in advance, but we're limited a lot of times just to the length of the lane closure. So that's what we're doing. Right. Um, so the way it works without getting too far into the details is that the inspector is able to set their um, work zone on the app for however long the project is. So they could extend it past the project start if they wanted to, like they, they set that up. And then we, we notify that that entire uh, project that the works or the inspector set up is active, regardless of where the, the piece of equipment is on the job site. Um, so it's not necessarily based specifically on we're only telling where the paver is located. Um, it's based on that there's activity and then what the inspector said was the job site. If that distinction makes sense, David. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we had a question in the chat. That's a good one. How do we track short loads? Sometimes we can't use every ton that hits the road. And so how does that remain tonnage, remaining tonnage get tracked? Um, within the e-ticketing platform, we've got um, the ability to mark a partial load as wasted. Um, so you could, you know, if it's a 24 ton load and at the end of the day, eight wasn't used, you can mark eight as wasted and do not pay. Um, and then it would, you know, not be included in the delivered total and it would there would be like a accumulating wasted total um so i think david makes a great point regarding the geofencing and the spec related to that because if the if the intent is to take away some of the inconsistency of the human element and human performance the geofencing makes a lot of sense but likewise, you got to have connectivity for that to happen. So I think those are both yep. very good points, you know, to to implement for where we ultimately want to end up here. And and like I said, that, that's something we have taken into consideration with uh, what we're doing with uh, basically the the Wi-Fi enabled work zone, and looking at mobile uh, repeaters and mobile enhancers. Uh, that can basically be placed uh, around the job site or placed in the back of a pickup truck and, and you know, driven to wherever the active portion of the work zone is such that we have connectivity for the equipment and for all the devices because, you know, the, the state's outfitted every inspector with an iPad. So we we rely on that connectivity from pretty much every, every job site as well. Awesome future with Prairie Contractors. Um, we have a plant in Southwest Louisiana that always struggles for internet. Uh, it's real spotty. Um, you know, sometimes we don't have internet for multiple days. Is there gonna be a spec to where if uh, internet goes rogue, we could resort to paper ticketing 
until we get internet again. The the paper ticket will be written in as the basically the backup. I mean that that is the plan. Um, okay, thank you. It it's like everything we have to nowadays. It's it's you know in, until we get that you know ninety nine point nine 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 percent of surety that we're going to have the connectivity. It's we're going to have to build in the backup plan as well. Austin, this is Matthew Madden. I have switched over several of our plants to Starlink Internet. It's about $600 to get the hardware and about $120 a month. It works great, and um, that will fix your Internet troubles. Appreciate that. I'm going to look into it. Thank you. That, that's not state-sponsored, but that's also... <laughs> That, that's also who we're looking at for some of this this Wi-Fi enabled work zone is is uh, some of the Starlink connected stuff. Yep. Is DOT inspector bringing the digital enhanced Wi-Fi, or is that the contractors to purchase? Uh, during the the demonstration and the pilot projects, uh, we're actually looking at purchasing the equipment. Uh, so it would be zero cost to you, but if we get into specification, that's probably something we'll write in as a pay item for uh, a construction project. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alvin had a good question here. Uh, will the department identify pilot projects for the e-ticketing and equipment monitoring prior to bid, or is the department looking for a contractor to volunteer a project? Right now, we're looking for contractors to volunteer project because we see uh, a lot of this as minimal impact. It's really setting up the data exchange, and after that, it's business as usual. So that's where we, we feel we can uh, basically just retrofit an existing project, and we cover all the costs through the, the grant funding and stick funding. Alvin, uh, I think David and I volunteer you to find the most rural job you've got in Northwest Louisiana with no connectivity, and let's fire that one up. Uh, someone asked if it has to be a DOT project. Uh, with the federal funding on it, it's probably going to have to be a DOT project. What other type project do you have in mind? Because the, the way we're handling some of this is through, uh, well, if, if it's a parish or city that is being paid through federal funding through DOT, then it should qualify. This is Matt Otwell with JB James. So on the timeline y'all put up there, it had February of 2024, and it had a, I thought, what was an e-ticketing e -ticketing requirement for PCC project from February of 2024. But now um, it's up. Go it, ahead. The, the requirement was going to be uh, for the, uh, when we extend the batch tolerances, we're basically going to have e-ticketing as a requirement uh, to qualify for the, the uh, widened tolerances for the batching. Okay. So, to get the wider tolerances, you would have to use e-ticketing, but that's not going to be February 24. What is the anticipated date on that? I've got a draft spec in, in progress, so it's it, we're probably not going to get it out by the end of February, but that should be here soon. Thank you. So, so Sorry, our timing's a little off. Yeah, my bad. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, one more question, Patrick. How does Hall Hub, DOT, and Headlight all, how is all that going to interact? Because it almost is like these are two standalone platforms. What's your vision, please? Uh, right now, they are standalone platforms. Uh, I have both groups uh, in initial discussions. And the goal here is that any information that can be fed to a daily work report or observation or you know whatever information we're capturing at the inspector level 
uh, in our headlight application, which for those of you that don't know is is our um, uh, just daily diaries and daily work reports, uh, we're hoping to be able to feed that information across. Uh, they both have open APIs set up. Uh, it's just a matter of getting the data exchange mapped out and getting the data flowing to the right place. Uh, again, this is where I, I said early on, it's we're hoping data gets entered one time and it gets where it needs to go. All right, let's go back to rebar delivery certificates. Truck shows up on can the rebar vendor slash manufacturer, he's got a truck loaded, he's got a bill of lading that has X, Y, and Z. God only knows how many different varieties. Can he scan that in to that vendor portal? which is going to go ultimately to the DOTP PE office. Is that considered, is that acceptable? Because what always gets lost are all these certificates of delivery. Because it gets to a superintendent on the job. It's technically handed to an inspector. An inspector lost it in the truck. The uh, contractor said he gave it to the inspector. He never did. Can the supplier upload it from the get-go, this was done, or does it have to be physically scanned in on the job site? How does that work? Because one of the things that kills finaling jobs is getting all the little bitty paperwork correct because contractor superintendents nor inspectors, they are not good at keeping all the paperwork straight. They're good at inspecting and building. They're not accountants. So elaborate, please. Uh, that was one of my initial challenges to uh, uh, the vendors was that exact problem. Is we is there a way that the supplier can input it and we mark it delivered? Is there a way that the reseller can input it? Is there a way that we can input it at the plant level? Is there a way that we can input it at the DOT level such that at any point we can upload that information? Uh, and and that's something that, uh, you know, Paul Hub took as a challenge and actually showed me something the other day that was pretty impressive. Uh, where, where, you know, the, they were showing. Uh, we, we got a rogue talker there. Um, but but they were showing, uh, uh, you know, s several different types of documentation being uploaded. Uh, and and actually using some AI to pull out the relevant information uh, regards to certificates of delivery for a certain material. So it, it was pretty impressive. Um, we've, we've also talked to them because I, I know when I've talked to several suppliers, they have a system in place where they just push a button and shipment's on its way. Well, when that shipment gets sent, is there a way that we can, you know, if that's flagged for a certain vendor or flagged for a certain supplier or certain whoever, uh, can that, that digital information that's being generated on their end to actually generate that bill of, of sale or bill of laden or CD or whatever certificate, can that information digitally be sent to our DOT portal? So we are looking at different ways of capturing that information so that it's it's all in one place and all goes to one place regardless of where it gets uploaded uh, and, and looking at the best way to capture it and best way to uh, receive it and acknowledge it and and like I said essentially track it all with the project um, but yes that is the plan is that the supplier should be able to send that information to the DOT portal and once it gets on site the contractor should be able to mark it as delivered and the DOT person should be able to go uh, yep accepted okay same thing with pot I know Matt Otwell has thousands of feet of pipe sitting in Bossier Parish right now. And I'm assuming he would like to know that it was all DOT certified and acknowledge that it's there digitally instead of an inspector physically counting every joint and looking for every DOT black sticker inside of a bale of a pipe. How does that work? Uh, that's something where if a DOT sticker is going on, we're hoping to get it at the, 
the point of the sticker being applied. Whatever information needs to be encoded with that sticker is basically digitally encoded and they scan it for when it's uh, shipped. They scan it when it gets delivered on site. So there, there's some of that that we can actually handle with, uh, you know, QR technology, QR code technology, or some, I know some states are using RFID to, to track items like that. Where all that information, the, the billing information, the material information, all gets encoded in that one unique identifier. And then anywhere it gets scanned, anywhere it gets pinged is, is essentially the location of that information. It's very similar to how FedEx and Amazon and U.S. Postal Service get mail from point A to point B, right? Hey, Patrick, this is uh, Tate Acosta with R.J. Daigle. Um, what is the security of Hall Hub and the software? Just as, as we increase uh, pathways, uh, you know, from we all have Fleet Watcher or, or something like Fleet Watcher, we have um, you know, these uh, equipment monitoring systems, Samsara, things like that. As we continue to uh, provide access to other entities with this, how, how do we secure this and make sure it's secure as we create pathways into our uh, equipment software, into our asphalt plant software? You, you want to take that one? Yeah, down? yeah, I can take that one. Um, yeah, we take security very seriously. We've got a security page on our website that we can share, but um, we are we have several certifications around our security for like software certifications, SOC two type two compliant. Um, the connector tool we use um, to connect to some of these the plant systems is. PCI and HIPAA and FedRAMP certified, those types of things. Not that we're moving PCI compliant data, but it's it's um, approved for that. So um, everything that enters our system goes into your um, contractor or supplier account and isn't shared unless you explicitly give it permission within our system to be shared. Um, so it looks like Mike, my colleague, just shared that link with the kind of the details of what cert certifications we have and our philosophy on security. Uh, something along the same lines, I think I got in a direct message. Has there been any discussions about ensuring that production slash TPR slash paver speed will not be shared by DOTD to other contractors? Uh, it, we basically treat it like the the project file. It's It basically all goes into the project file for department use. So that that's something we're... If we need to have discussions on that, as far as future, let's let's talk now. But the current plan is uh, it's essentially being treated as part of the project file. Question on storage. So if the uh, if the contractor from this e ticketing information, if the contractor themselves wants to retain some of that submitted data, just like they would retain paper. Uh, for their internal project file, is that able uh, to be done as well? Uh, of course, that would ensure if, you know, if the department's file gets corrupted or something of that regard, but just, you know, wanting to have an internal copy for themselves, uh, if you could speak to that, if that's possible. So there, we do obviously have the contractor login where they're able to see the information and access it whenever they'd like to in real time. And so that has exporting capabilities in standard exporting formats where they could store it locally um, in Excel, CSV, PDF, those types of things. But that also like once you get access to that where you, there's not a time limit, like when the projects is over, you still have access to it. Um, that type of thing. So it's just a standard login that we would set up for you. Yes. Patrick, do you, let's say the inspector, he has acknowledged 80 asphalt tickets in a day. At the end of the day, I'm assuming Hall Hub has a end of the day report Excel that it's ticket number JMF tons. Does that go to DOT or does the inspector have to 
fool with 85 individual emails to acknowledge that or, you, or is DOT going to use the end of the day report and for payment to acknowledge the whole day versus all, a bunch of emails? How does that work? Uh, that's where we're hoping to actually get the two systems connected. Now, right now, it's basically the, the information just flowing directly to us, so we, we can use it as individual or as the whole. But that's where we're actually hoping to get our, our contract management system connected with this so that essentially the daily work report, you can just say these tickets were assigned to this daily work report, and it's all included. So again, you, you enter at one time and you connect it where it needs to be connected and, and reporting's done. Thank you. Well, I know we're almost at time here. Um, happy to stick around if there are more questions, just kind of action items here. I shared the link to the story map of the demonstration project in Delaware. So please reference that. Um, please reach out to us if you have additional questions or have projects in mind that you'd like to start a conversation on. The sooner the better for that conversation, even if the project's later this year. Um, or if it's next week, we, we'd be happy to start that conversation and, and get the ball rolling. The further ahead we can get on this stuff, the better uh, for both e-ticketing and then also the connected equipment. Um, the, you know, the goal is to have e-ticketing on, on as much as possible and then the connected equipment on, on projects that are capable as well. So, uh, Patrick, unless you've got any closing thoughts, um, I appreciate the time, everybody. Uh, I have a question. My name is Roger Gonzalez. I'm quality control for Build Supply. Uh, it shows here that this uh, entire meeting is uh, being recorded. What's the availability of getting that email to me so that I can share this with uh, my Q IT department? Yeah, um, I can share the me the meeting after this with the uh, association heads, and then they can share it to their members. Would probably be the most efficient thing to do there. Um, Excellent. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Good question. So, How much advance? Sorry. Yes. Uh, this is Alvin. There's a was a question on uh, the chat that it, sure. and I, I didn't don't think I heard anybody discuss it. Uh, the pilot projects do they have to be DOTD or could they be parish or city? That was the question. I was wondering what the answer was. I, th I think with the way that uh, we're pulling from the federal grants, they probably want them to have some type of federal uh, okay. shared cost on it. So that, that's going to be the preference. But let me know which ones you have in mind, and I'll see what I can do. Al, I was just curious. Relden nominated me to find the, the, the worst possible location. <laughs> and that might not be a DOTD. It might be Parish. Okay. <laughs> so. I'm just curious. There's, there's another good question. How much advance notice do you need to kick off a job? And is there a minimum tonnage? I can speak to the advance notice. I'll let Patrick speak to the minimum tonnage. Um, for e-ticketing, to connect to your plants, you ideally, we've done it the day before. It's not ideal for our team nor your team because there's a bit of scrambling that has to happen to connect to your plants. So a week in advance to get connected to your plant should be sufficient. The sooner the better for e-ticketing on connecting to your plants. Uh, but once we're connected to your plant, then it's uh, as soon as we get a ticket, you're able to share it to the DOT. We only have to connect to your plant once, and then it's just automatically running in the background. Um, for equipment, um, we probably would want more, more of a lead way just to uh, there's a bit more coordination around what equipment you have, what's capable connecting to those APIs. Um, there's not a hard and fast rule. Uh, we work fast here at Hall Hub, um, but that's kind of the distinguish the, the distinguishment between e-ticketing versus the equipment pilots. And as far as a minimum job, uh, you know, we we prefer to to have the ones we can do more thorough on. Uh, but but like I said, some of this is quick setup, and if we get it on one project, a lot of times people see the benefits and immediately start, hey, let me use it on the next project next project because we saw that with several district units with e-ticketing uh, that you know once they started that that's where they wanted to go 
So I know this is a lot of what if questions, but what if a contractor is interested in just kind of sticking their toe in the water when it comes to e-ticketing and maybe they want to track delivery shipments, et cetera, to the job site, but maybe their equipment isn't ready uh, to be connected to kind of do the full Monty. Is it possible to like start small and then build up? Yes, I should have been more clear about that. E-ticketing, we'll take every project for e-ticketing. Uh, we understand that the connected equipment is a bit more advanced. And so there's no problem with doing only e-ticketing projects and then being more selective on the equipment projects. But the vice, the reverse doesn't work. We have to have e-tickets to do the equipment. We don't have to have equipment to do e-tickets. Does, does that distinction? Yeah, okay. All right, well, I think we're at time. So, Appreciate it, everyone. Yeah, thank, thank you much. Uh, like I said, it's definitely an opportunity to, to learn and grow together, and, and we welcome any and all. So, looking forward to it. You got my contact info. Uh, you got Joel's contact info. Again, hit, hit me up for anything and everything, and, and I'm willing to answer questions. I'm willing to hash things out. I'm willing to to have the, the tough talks if we need to have the tough talks, so. Thanks everyone, appreciate it, have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.